Welcome to Financial Perspectives, the podcast, where we cover timely topics related to the current economic environment and keep you up to date on investment news. We also provide insights on how investors can maintain a long-term perspective. Please stick around at the end for important disclosure information. More information about Foster Group can be found in our ADV brochure at fostergrp.com. Well, the news cycle really heated up last week with the Democratic presidential soon-to-be nominee Kamala Harris announcing her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz. At the same time, global stock markets experienced a spate of volatility unlike anything we'd seen over the past 12 months of relative calm. It was likely triggered by a lackluster hiring report on Friday and a steep drop in Japan's stock market overnight. The U.S. stock market declined 3% on Monday, August 5th, while the VIX, the measure of stock market volatility, spiked briefly to over 60, closing finally at 38.57. You know, the market stabilized on Tuesday and the VIX decreased significantly on Tuesday and Wednesday. This so-called volatility gauge had been hovering around the mid to upper teens for most of the past 12 months. So it had been really low, lulling some investors to sleep, kind of causing us to forget that perceived bad news when it shows up is always lurking just around the corner. Never letting a potential for fear-based attention go to waste, the financial media jumped in with headlines about stock market crashes harkening back to 1987. I was watching CNBC during the early morning hours on Monday, and I wondered if they could have found a bigger type size for the red, all-caps headline, Market Sell-Off. So that makes this week a good time to remember and to remind ourselves as investors that entry-year pullbacks of greater than 10% occur in most years. So it should really be an expectation of an equity investor that one will happen now and then, even though most of the time people seem surprised when it actually occurs. Of course, this week, in the end of last week, the market has pretty much recovered, so it's become somewhat of a non-event. However, for this episode of Financial Perspectives, I've got a special guest here to talk about a really interesting finding around how many stocks it takes to really move our portfolio, to really move the market. It's a surprisingly small number. Michael Westfall is the Director of Investments for Foster Group. And Michael has a wealth of experience as a portfolio manager. He's got a degree in mathematics. He's a self-professed and maybe confessed data geek. And I can attest to that part of it. Anyway, Michael, you've been telling me about some fascinating research by Hendrik Bessenbinder. I think I got that name right. Yep. So tell me what caught your attention. What attracted you to his work? Well, yeah. Thanks for having me here, Kent. Uh, Hendrik Bessenbinder is a professor at Arizona State University, known for his just extensive research on stock market performance and long-term investment returns. His work particularly interests me due to my quantitative background and experience in picking individual stocks. And his research really provides a unique perspective on the market, emphasizing the rarity of high-performing stocks and the importance of diversification. Uh, One of Bessenbinder's most notable findings is that a very small percentage of stocks account for the majority of the market's long-term gains. One of his more recent papers from 2023, he identified the top five firms for shareholder wealth creation for the 30-year period from 1990 to 2020 of about 64,000 global companies. Uh, They are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, which you may know as Google, and Tencent, Chinese company. So when Michael told me this list the first time, I thought Tencent, my first thought was, is that a rapper? And they go, oh, no, really? I understand it's a, it's a Chinese stock. So outside of the United States, did it surprise you that a foreign stock made that list, that top five value of a kind of share creation? Uh, yeah, it was pretty surprising, but it really highlights the global nature of market leaders and the importance of considering international diversification. Mm-hmm. Now, diversification often looks silly over the short term. Uh, However, the whole point of investing is achieving your financial goals, not just beating the market or getting the highest return you can. So a simpler solution than trying to find a needle in the haystack is to just buy the whole haystack. Just buy the haystack. You have said that it's just a very small number of stocks that drive kind of long-term equity returns. Mm -hmm. As we discuss this, I was amazed at how many stocks underperform the treasury bill or the risk, what we think of as the risk-free rate, that so many stocks underperform, it takes quite a few stocks to get us back to that rate. And then just even more to kind of realize those equity returns long-term. What are some of the numbers around that that you shared with me? I just think they're fascinating. Sure. So Bessenbinder's research shows that about four out of seven stocks or about 57% have historically underperformed the risk-free rate. If we only owned those underperformers, 
our portfolio would look just awful. Uh, so then the kind of the next follow-up question is, how many winners do we need to balance out the losers just to get back to that risk-free rate? The answer is the next 39% of stocks. So you have the bottom 57%, and then the next best 39% would provide you the same return as just the risk-free rate. That's 96% of the total market. You could have owned 96% of the stock market for the last almost 100 years and only received the same return as someone holding zero risk treasuries. <laughs> that's, that's just quite a distribution. I mean, only one in 25 stocks really turn out to be the big winners, that top 4%. That makes stocks, just, just those few give us the return, really, we think of the equity premium of the market return over a cash-like asset, like the risk-free uh, rate. That just seems like an incredibly small number. Just how challenging is it, do you think, to pick out those 4%, those 1 in 25? I mean, it's difficult, if not impossible, to reliably identify, you know, what's called a 4% needle, a 1 in 25 stock. Uh, <laughs> the only way really is to re reliably stuff your portfolio full of valuable needles is just to, as I said, buy the haystack. You know, don't even try to find the needles. Don't hope that you'll stumble across them. Uh, just you can guarantee that you will own all of those needles by buying a little sliver of every stock out there. Mm. You know, the track record of recent outperforming stocks like the Magnificent Seven uh, might give you just the impression that stocks that deliver outsized returns uh, over a given interval recently are more likely to do so again. Mm. Now, studies really show that there's little or no evidence that a strategy of investing in those stocks that previously had a really great return are going to have abnormally high returns going forward in the years ahead. That's that idea of persistence. Yeah. The things that have done well in the past and continue to do equally well or even better in the future. You know, it seems like a big takeaway from Bess and Binder's research is that a lot of stocks, historically more than half, will provide returns lower than in the risk-free treasury bill rate. And that those select few, maybe one in 25, will become the really big winners that we love to talk about. And without those few, the market, as well as an investor's portfolio, really is going to look pretty pedestrian. Exactly. You know, broad diversification is just so important, as is avoiding temptation to do things like time the market or try to pick those individual winners. Yeah, I, I just kind of jump on that with an agreement that diversification is really important for both sides of the equation. One side is protecting losses, so I'm not just invested in something that's failing. I've got some other things in the portfolio, but if I really want to make sure I own the winners... I need to be broadly diversified because there's so few of those big winners. If I'm not broadly diversified, the likelihood is I could miss one or two or three. But if I just miss a few, it could really have a detrimental effect on the portfolio. Mm -hmm. you know, as we've talked about for many years, there are predictable mistakes that investors should try hard to avoid. And one of them is this idea of stock selection or stock picking as though that's the secret to having the best portfolio. We think I'm going to identify a few stocks. And then with those few stocks, I'm going to kind of concentrate the portfolio. And then maybe I'm even going to time into when to get in and out of those few stocks. Statistics would say that's not a particularly great way to achieve a market-like return. Hmm. No, for sure. Uh, you know, you're know, you going to see a lot of stocks underperform and a lot of stocks uh, or a small number of stocks outperform. Uh, let's take an interesting example of Altria Group, which uh, prior to 2003 was known as Philip Morris. Uh it's up something like 265 million percent over the last almost 100 years. Uh, that just works out to like 16.3 percent annually. You know, being around for about 100 years, really less compounding do a lot of the work. But on the flip side, many companies have gone bankrupt, uh, taking their stock prices down to zero. One of the big ones would be WorldCom, you know, wiped out over $100 billion when it went bankrupt back in 2002. So you have both outcomes. You have, you know, equity markets of a whole, as a whole, though, generating kind of that long-term 8 to 10% equity market return. Yeah. So we sound a little bit like a broken record here because we're really talking about the balance in the market of there are underperformers, there are outperformers, the combination of all of those stocks in the market, if we own them all, it's kind of the most, well, it gives us the highest likelihood of getting the market return, which over time has been very good for investors. Mm -hmm. So a good example year for this idea of kind of winners and losers was really in 2020. In that year of the companies in the S&P 500, 196 or about 40% of them had a negative return. But amazingly, the 2020 S&P 500 return, including the 40% that lost money, was a positive 18.4%. 
the top 5 to 10% of stocks had to have very high returns, both to offset those with losses, but also to generate the 18.4% overall positive return. You know, Michael, the more I think about Best and Binder's findings, the more the stock market begins to sound a little bit like venture capital. A venture capitalist knows they're investing in a kind of a portfolio of companies, early stage companies, with the expectation that a number of them are just going to fail. They're just going to go to zero. Some of them are going to do okay, but there's going to be a couple that are going to be home runs, and that's going to really make the difference for the whole portfolio. You know, that's a great analogy, Kent. Uh, you know, we have an asset class here in stocks where the most common outcome is to have a loser. Uh, but there are just some really, really big gainers in there that might, you know, give you a 100x or a 1,000x on your money. Uh, and that's enough to make investing in stocks really desirable. And that sounds just like venture capital or private equity investing, not the public stock market. <laughs> yeah. When you use the example of the Philip Morris or Altria and, you know, multiple millions of percent return over long periods of time, I two things. One is, hey, the stock's a winner. But two is compounding is the thing that we're really after. We want to be thinking long-term and letting those winners continue to generate uh, high returns for us over time in our portfolio. So one other question comes to mind here. One of the things that we've noticed recently is the number of stocks traded in public markets has been declining over the years. But on the other hand, the number of funds, exchange-traded funds and mutual funds, has been going up dramatically, so much so that the number of funds available to investors now outnumbers the number of stocks available in markets. So it kind of begs the question, okay, if stocks have this kind of distribution where most of them are disappointing and a few of them are great, is the same kind of statistic true for funds or managers? It certainly is, Kent. And you know, there might be a few managers out there that have the skill not only to avoid a lot of those losers, but they can also identify some of those one in 25 winners with some sort of reliability. You know, so then the challenge comes to us as investors in finding those managers who can display that skill. Uh, let's look at Amazon, you know, one of the companies I mentioned earlier. Uh, over a two-year period, late uh, 1999 to uh, late 2001, they had a 95% decline in price, hmm. Amazon. Um, and so you probably would have fired your fund manager if they held Amazon in your portfolio because they lost 95% of your money. Uh, little did you know that they were actually demonstrating skill and identifying one of those high-flying companies that would be uh, enough to you know, generate above the equity market return. So you know, all that being said, uh, I just want to reiterate, the key to successful investing is to focus on achieving your investment goals, not just beating the market or getting the highest return you possibly can. Diversification, risk management, and a disciplined approach are so essential. Uh, understanding and applying the lessons from research like Bess and Binders, you know, really helps us make more uh, informed investment decisions for our clients. Yeah, I think that Amazon example is a great one when it comes to thinking long term, because here's a company that at the time, like you said, it's gone down over 90% in the stock price in a couple of years. Most people at that point would be saying, okay, this uh, online bookstore thing is just not going to work. <laughs> and now we look back at it and go, boy, if you just held Amazon for that entire period, you would have had one of the top five performing in terms of, you know, shares that create wealth for investors, but you had to hold yeah. through a very disappointing moment. And you know what they say about a stock that's down 90%. It's a stock that was down 80% and then got cut in half again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the Amazon owners who held long-term, those very few managers, they were obviously greatly rewarded. But part of that kind of goes back to this idea of having investment principles. And one of the things that I've noticed with Bess and Binder's research is that it really does correspond with a number of our five investment principles. Mm -hmm. You know, embracing uncertainty, trusting markets, avoiding predictable mistakes. The market is still a great portfolio to start with, the whole market. And if you're going to try and pick winners and losers, don't go too far from owning that whole market. Even with all the good data and research we have today, it's virtually impossible to know with certainty what those high-performing 1 in 25 stocks will be or who those 1 in 25 managers who achieve a remarkable, a remarkable return will be prior to it happening. Only with the benefit of hindsight, seeing 10 to 20 years of great performance in the rearview mirror, can we be certain of what those results really are. Mike Beto, thanks for joining us today and kind of giving us some perspective from an academic article that most of us are not going to read, but bringing to us kind of some relative, uh, relevant statistics that we can think about and I think make the application to our portfolios. You know, our goal in these podcasts is to contribute to you, our listeners, becoming educated and prepared optimists 
If there are topics or questions you'd like us to address, please let us know at our website, www.fostergrp.com, and click on the words Financial Perspectives. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can help us spread the message of educated optimism by liking us on your podcast app. As always, thanks for investing some of your time and attention with us today. The previous presentation by Foster Group was intended for general information purposes only. No portion of the presentation serves as the receipt of, or as a substitute for, personalized investment advice from Foster Group or any other investment professional of your choosing. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risk, and it should not be assumed that future performance of any specific investment or investment strategy, or any non-investment related or planning services, discussion or content, will be profitable, be suitable for your portfolio or individual situation, or prove successful. Foster Group is neither a law firm nor accounting firm, and no portion of its services should be construed as legal or accounting advice. No portion of the content should be construed by a client or prospective client as a guarantee that he or she will experience a certain level of results if Foster Group is engaged, or continues to be engaged, to provide investment advisory services. A copy of Foster Group's current written disclosure brochure discussing our advisory services and fees is available upon request or at www.fostergrp.com disclosures.